Well, I'm so glad that you guys are here. Good morning to those of you that weren't here when we did the welcome. So we're glad you've been able to slide in and join us. We add about 20% uh, each Sunday between the welcome and the message time. Before we get started um, back in Matthew 5, I want to give Tori just a minute uh, to say a word about Seamless, the women's Bible study that's uh, gathering on Wednesday night uh, for the next six, seven weeks. Um, she's been through it before. Let's give her a second to say a word to you about that. Morning, you guys. So um, I did Seamless for the first time when my daughter was born about five, oh my gosh, five years ago. Um, and I've been a Christian since I was about seven years old. And I've read my Bible throughout that time, but I kind of viewed the God of the Old Testament as the mean God and the God of the New Testament <laughs> as the gracious God. And this Bible study was exactly what I needed when I needed it. Um, because it showed me that God's character is constant throughout scripture. Um, I had never learned to read the story of the Bible. I never knew the context of kings and judges and chronicles and how they all went together. And this is super accessible if you've been a Christian for a long time, if you're a new believer. Um, it's very easy to grasp. It's just a basic overview. And it really changed the way I understand God and his character. So I hope that you will come, if you're a lady, <laughs> on Wednesday nights and come and join us for the Seamless Bible Study. Thank you, Sorry. Thank you. Um, ladies, if you're interested in that and you haven't signed up, so just so they can make sure they have books for you, just write the word seamless uh, on your connection card. Write seamless on your connection card somewhere, and uh, when you turn it in, uh, we'll uh, reach out to you, staff will, this week, and make sure you're there. Also, on Wednesday night, um, for the, at least the foreseeable future, we're going to have a uh, sermon-based discussion group that's paralleling that. So, men, if your wife's wife, if your wife, only one wife at a time, if your wife it's supposed to be one wife uh, for life, but we've changed it to one wife at a time uh, in the States. But i got to get out of this. If, you're, uh, if your wife is going to Seamless, we'd love to have you there um, uh, seeking how you can obey and put legs to the message. i got to get in here before I get in trouble. All right. Um, also, for those of you who happen to pay attention uh, to the sermon or series bumper before we get in, it mentions widows. I don't know why. There's no mention of widows in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, these bumpers sometimes we create entirely in-house. Sometimes we take and edit ones that uh, we receive from different resources. And whoever put this one together that we slapped our image on the end of clearly had not read as much about the Sermon on the Mount as their creative juices were empowering them to create. So we're going to make sure that stops next week. Uh, I, saw with, uh, I just saw it for the first time last week and was horrified over there uh, in an instant. So Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning again uh, as we continue through our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Over the past four to six years, and particularly over the last 12 to 24 months, the temperature of division and rhetoric and confusion in churches across the United States has risen. And over the last 12 to 24 months, it's really reached a boiling point. And it's been an interesting time. It's been Sad in some ways, challenging in others. It has certainly been a reflective time to be a committed follower of Jesus. Uh, it's also been an interesting time to be a pastor and to spend regular times in discussion with other men and women who are leading at different levels of the church around our country. What's been fascinating to watch is people exiting, not, not people on the fringes who are coming exploring faith, looking for something real and tangible and true, but long-time professing Christians and members of churches leaving simultaneously the same church because their church has become too political or because their church is not political enough. At the same time, we've seen members leaving the same churches because in their view, their church had placed too much emphasis on racial reconciliation while others in the church were leaving because their church had placed too little emphasis on racial reconciliation. And over the last year, we've seen as we have here in our church, members exit the church because the church wasn't, in their opinion, requiring enough mask wearing, while others were exiting the church simultaneously because the church was requiring any mask wearing at all. We've moved into this, this long season, this, this great season of significant confusion about who we are and who we are supposed to be in Christ. And it has been interesting and dismaying to watch Christianity today 
had an article out this last week. The title was called The Splintering of the Evangelical Soul. The Splintering of the Evangelical Soul. If you um, haven't read it, and I'm sure most of you have not, I would really encourage you to Google Christianity Today. Click on the link and it will be up there as the featured editorial for this week. I want to read you just a little segment about it. Uh, as the article outlines the, the fracturing and splintering of the evangelical church. Couples, families, friends, and entire congregations, once united in their commitment to Christ, are now dividing over seemingly irreconcilable views of the world. In fact, they are not just dividing, but becoming incomprehensible to one another. One person in a group that had gathered just to, to discuss just just normal, regular, everyday church people with families, with jobs, with commitments, who love Jesus and are cu just curious about what they're seeing and experience, gathered to discuss this with one another. One person mourned that she could no longer understand her parents or how their views of the world had so suddenly and painfully shifted. Another described friends who were demographically identical, who had once stood beside him on practically every issue, but who now promoted ideas, promoted ideas he found shocking. Still another said her church was breaking up entirely, driven apart by mutual suspicion and misunderstanding. And then this haunting question or two. What do you do when you feel you're losing the people you love to a false reality? What do you do with the humbling truth that they have precisely the same fear about you. I mean, has anyone sensed this over the last year or two? I hope that's yes. I hope that's yes. So the key question that Jesus gets to in the section of Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to look at this morning, addresses the question of what the relationship is between followers of Jesus and the world. What is the relationship between us and the world? Who are we to be as the people of God? Blood-bought, redeemed, in the process of being sanctified through and by the power of the Spirit of God. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5 and read what will be for many people and are for most people the most familiar verses in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? If it is no longer good for anything, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me pray for us real quick before we walk through these verses a bit. Heavenly Father, I ask you, I plead with you, God, that you would give us new eyes to see and new ears to hear verses that are often far more familiar than lived out in our lives. God, allow them to, to soak into our souls in a way that I certainly can't cause Myself, stir us, open our hearts and minds, change us this morning. I ask humbly and confidently in your name, amen. All right, typically when you hear this preached or taught, uh, it's, it's largely an exposition of, of salt and a little bit of light. Salt was this, salt was that, salt was the other. Salt creates thirst, salt preserves, salt flavors. So on and so forth. And I'll mention a little bit of that. But what I want to do this morning, I think the message that God has for us in this text comes from the, 
the parts of, of Jesus' words that we often skip about salt losing its saltiness and about light being hidden under a bucket, not placed out where it can shine. The, the, big, the big thing that Jesus hears would have heard, and again I remind you who he's speaking to here when he says, you are the salt of the earth. He's speaking to his followers. And he's speaking at this time to men and women of a kind of peasant class in their world, living under subjugation. And it would have been stunning to them that both men and women, the underclass of their society, were being called by Jesus the salt of the world. And, and obviously we do know that salt preserves and salt flavors. In fact, if you've ever over-salted, you know how much salt flavors. And they would have known this in their day, in a day without refrigerators. Or as my dad often calls it, the icebox. Salt really, really was significant. And I do think Jesus is saying something about that, that, that salt doesn't take on the property of its host, but its host takes on its property. I remember one time Mother Teresa was asked if she was scared of contracting leprosy or some other disease by working with the poor and the sick of Calcutta. And she said, no. She said, this is Jesus I'm ministering to. And what she was saying was that I bring hope and peace and healing in and through the name of Jesus to them. They don't break me up or fracture me. And this is what we see throughout Jesus' ministry as he went around. As he intentionally chose to be in the company of and share meals with and do life with broken and sinful people who the religious and uptight did not like and did not agree with. They didn't change Jesus. Jesus changed them. And it was and is incredibly valuable. We take it valuable. We take it for granted in our society because it's so easily accessible. But I, and I know this will, this is a little bit of a nerd out on salt, but I've got a, a book on my desk that I was referencing back and looking back at this week called Salt, A World History by Mark Kurlansky. It's a really, really good book. Uh, about the, the role that salt has played um, in society. He says in there that salt, the only rock we eat. Now, I've got two-year-olds, so I know technically it's not the only rock we eat. But it's the only rock we should eat, and the only rock we eat consistently. He said, has, has made a glittering, often surprising contribution to the history of mankind. Now, don't lose the connection that Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth, and he's speaking to a group that, that is supposed to be defined by the Beatitudes that we went through last week. He's talking to a group that is supposed to have had a change. And because we've been changed by God and our hearts and minds have been made new and are being made new, and our lives are characterized by something different, God, through us, is preserving and flavoring a broken and fallen world. New Testament scholar D.A. Carson says this, Such Christians, Christians marked by the Beatitudes and by this passage, such Christians refuse to rob their employers by being lazy on the job or to rob their employees by succumbing to greed and stinginess. They are the first to help a colleague in difficulty, and last to return a barbed reply. They honestly desire the advancement of the other's interest and honestly dislike smutty humor. Transparent in their honesty and genuine in their concern, they reject both the easy answer of the doctrinaire politician and the laissez-faire stance of the sec selfish secular person. Meek in personal demeanor, they are bold in righteous pursuits. Challenging paragraph, is it not? But Carson's right. These are the kind of people Jesus is describing and the kind of people that you and I should be becoming more and more day in and day out regardless of life circumstances if we're followers of Jesus. Now, light. When you think about light, you know that light invades whatever space it encounters. I went into our bedroom last night. Sharon had already gotten in bed, and she was reading a little bit. 
and had a little lamp on by the bed. And I went in to turn the ceiling fan on because amazing as it is to me, she can sleep with no fans on at all in the room. Anybody else struggle with that? I can't do that. I need moving air and a lot of it. But I walked in and flipped on the ceiling fan. I thought, but I actually flipped on the light and I saw her, you know, she went like that instantly. Because light invades. It invades whatever space it encounters. Darkness has no power over it at all. We've heard this, but it's so true. The most expansive darkness cannot, cannot put out the smallest light. All right? The most expansive darkness cannot put out the smallest light. Light is always on the offense. So we, we are sought, our, our character and our heart and our minds, our values, our worldviews should be shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Should be shaped by the character of God and the truth of God revealed in his word. D.A. Carson goes on to describe some of this influence of believers being salt and light throughout history. We don't have this quote up on the screen or, uh, for you, but he just notes, and rightly so, that prison reform, medical care, trade unions that protect the dignity of workers, abolition of slavery, abolition of child labor, establishment of orphanages and senior care centers, reform of the penal code and various aspects of legal injustice, in all these areas, followers of Jesus led the drive for righteousness. That's the impact of salty Christians being light in a dark and broken world. Now, if we look back at the verses I referenced earlier, I think there's something very, very significant here that we need to pay attention to. Jesus says in the latter part of verse 13, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And he says that it's, it's not useful for anything. It's no good. It has no purpose anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. I submit to you that part of the reason our society makes such fun of Christians on television shows and news shows and in songs is that we've earned it over the last 50 years by not being true salt and light. By constantly speaking about rules and codes of ethics that we were not living out ourselves collectively. By being quick to judge and slow to love. Sometimes I, you know, I'll, I'll see something on TV and they're, uh, they're, they're doing a character of, of Christians and it, it kind of annoys me. I'm like, no, I've got to sit here and receive this because it's actually pretty accurate. Right? We've We've earned that. Salt, salt, in a sense, can't lose its saltiness, but it can become contaminated. It can become contaminated and was often in Jesus' day and often throughout world history. Other minerals would be brought into salt. Salt would be sold, but it was actually contaminated. Uh, early American settlers did this a lot with whiskey. They would water down whiskey or alcohol and continue to sell it though it was less and less of what it was promised to be. But I just want to say a word about uh, salt losing its saltiness and light losing its, its light. Salt becomes contaminated. Salt becomes contaminated when we confuse knowledge with obedience. Salt becomes contaminated when we confuse knowledge with obedience, or if you will, information with transformation. There has been no more informed, knowledgeable church in the history of the church than the evangelical church in the United States over the last 100 or 200 years. But what we have found and what we continually find is more studies does not automatically equal deeper disciples. I've said this over and over, and I will say it over and over, that you're going to run into people who know ten times more Bible than you, but they're twice as mean. That is an acquisition of knowledge without a heart of obedience toward that knowledge. It's the, it's the acquiring of information without the Spirit-led transformation of someone's heart and character. Religious checklists have proven to be a dismal failure. 
at creating people who are passionate about the beauty and the glory of God and deeply committed to being seriously formed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I, when I grew up in church, like nobody had, well, of, of established churches, none of us had chairs, we all had pews, right? Uncomfortable, long pews. And in the back of the pews were, were tiny little giving envelopes. And you'd pull those giving envelopes out, barely big enough to fit a dollar in, I don't know why you make it hard to fit something in a giving envelope. You'll notice ours are large. We want it to be very easy for you to give. Drop in rings or watches if you want. Um, We'll convert that stuff, baptize it, and use it for kingdom purposes, right? But on those little envelopes, some of you will remember, if this is your background, they would have a place where you could check present. I don't know. (laughs) That was always funny to me. Like if they got the envelope with anything in it, they would assume you're present. But you could check present. Bible brought. Check. Lesson studied. Check. Bible read daily. Yeah, more or less. Check. You know. Spent time in serious prayer this week. God, thank you for this day. Check. Right? I, don't, I still don't know what that was about. I know as a kid we got little stars for attendance. I don't know if like in the staff hall, because I definitely never imagined spending my days on a, on a pastoral staff hall of a church. I don't know if on the staff hall they had charts like that for members, you know, and the, see who was leading the stars. I don't know, right? But what those little checklists did not do is transform lives. Because you can check all those boxes and it still not get from your head to your heart. So salt becomes contaminated when we confuse knowledge for obedience, information for transformation. Light is hidden when we confuse programs for mission or systems for the substance of what is supposed to be being delivered there. Um, Let me just say a few words about this. I, I am a child of the 80s. I grew up in the 80s, and our church built a family life center. Anybody remember the family life center days? We were so excited. It had uh, volleyball courts, basketball courts, um, the little hard ball you hit, but I can't, racquetball. Is it racquetball? Something, someone's nodding. I don't know, some other kind of ball court that you played on. They had saunas. We had saunas for men and women. Maybe we were trying to sweat out the, the impurities. I don't know. We had a weight room. We had a game room. We had all kinds of things in there. And this was kind of the highlight right before death, of that era of if we build it big enough and nice enough, we'll sort of Christianize all of these aspects of society. Everyone's going to come in here. And they did for about a year or two. In my home church, it had that big family life center and all the programs that all of us knew who grew up in church, at least Baptist churches back in that day, had on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, all blowing going large has now declined by nearly 80%. In attendance. They just refused to release the programs. They confused the programs with mission. They confused systems with substance. In other words, I always ask the question, well, what is something supposed to accomplish? And we see uh, churches, we do this all the time, whatever the program is, however old it is or new it is, uh, we, can, we can somehow get afraid that if we change something or, or we stop doing some kind of program, we're like, well, how will people grow? Well, the triune God has a way of working in his sovereignty both through and around and in spite of sometimes our programs. Whatever it is, small groups, home groups, meeting in home. The home group is not the point, but the deep biblical community that's supposed to be taking place there around the Word of God as men and women are, are sharing with one another and praying for one another and crying with one another and carrying one another's burdens and inviting guests in to see what community looks like. That's the point, right? Sunday school. Sunday school's not the point, but the learning and the sharpening and the, and the, the growing of a heart shaped by Scripture is the point always so on and so on it's so easy to confuse programs for mission and systems for substance so so if that's not it if we're not salt and light because we have more knowledge 
and we attend certain programs regularly, what, what is it that God's intending here? Because Jesus says we can lose our saltiness. And in verse 14, verses 14 and 15, he says that, that this light can actually be hidden. That the lamp can be, can be put under a bowl, but that's not his intent. I want to just say a few words with you about how, how you and I ultimately are salt and light with some stories. As I uh, spent some time over the last couple of weeks talking to friends and just asking for stories of what's going on pre-pandemic, throughout the pandemic, post-ish, as hopefully we're coming out of the pandemic right now. Here are a couple of stories that I hope will, will illustrate the way that I believe God's ultimately called us to be salt and light. A couple of businessmen who work in a, a downtown city environment, they work close to one another, uh, both members of the same church decided they were going to get together on a Thursday, and, and they had an extended lunch period. Truthfully, they could take about as long as they wanted, uh, which I know is not a luxury everyone has, but they had it. And they said, man, let's go down to this McDonald's close to where we live. Let's get 50 cheeseburgers, so it's like $3, you know. Um, and, and then let's run to Walmart. Let's go to the little travel section. They went there, and they got a, a bunch of dozens of toothbrushes and toothpaste and little bars of soap and shampoos. And they, on the spot, put together these little kits with their 50 cheeseburgers. And then they drove in their nice businessman clothes to an area that was close to them that they knew was highly populated by the poor and by the homeless. And they just handed that stuff out with them and talked and smiled and listened and prayed with some of them. And it so impacted them, they said, man, let's, let's do this fairly regularly. And now it has grown to a few other men and women who are followers of Christ who meet up and do this a couple of times a month. And over the course of several years now, they've gotten to know these people. They've seen some of them become followers of Jesus. They know who is there because they want to be there. And those who are there because their life just blew up. And they wound up there. There were a, a couple of, of young ladies who were both teachers. They were in the same uh, midweek small group uh, in a home. And one night they were visiting after the small group had kind of finished up uh, gathering and talking and sharing. And they were just kind of hanging around eating. They got to, to talking. And one of them, his name uh, Rachel, uh, she teaches in a really low-income, under-sourced, under-resourced school. And she was sharing with her, her friend who did not teach in, in that kind of school about the, the intense struggles that her students and their families have, the lack of resources, the lack of, uh, of academic help. And they were, they were talking about that, and her friend said, you know what, said, I, I can, why don't I come over could you line up some that need tutoring? Oh, she said, absolutely, all of them almost. She said, I'll, I'll swing by, I'll leave, you know, as soon as, as, soon as my classwork is done and over uh, and I can leave, I'll jet out of there, I'll swing by and get something to eat, come over uh, to your school, let's just eat together and see if you can round up some and, and I'll just give a couple of hours and, and if you want to join me and we'll just give some, some free tutoring. Let's just tutor them and, and love on them. And she said, man, that would be awesome. And they did. They did. Now, a few years later, there are over a dozen other teachers, all followers of Christ, from their church and another church who are joining together, coming to that school now, week in and week out, spending two to three hours once a week tutoring low-income students in the name of Christ for His glory and the good of His world, being the hands and feet of Jesus, sometimes meeting physical needs, providing snacks, Loving on them, listening to them. They've gotten to know their families. They've assisted at times with needs that families had outside of there at Thanksgiving and Christmas and through tragic losses. They pulled resources and bought supplies. They began working with the administration of the school to meet other needs and create a culture of hope there. And it, this is not stuff that the church has programmed. This is men and women of Christ being salt and light. These are men and women of Christ using their own money and their own time and their own energy and their own gifts that God has given them. They're being light in darkness. Uh, there's a man, I was uh, talking with a friend, there's a man in his church who leads a neighborhood Bible study, just picks books of, Bible, uh, books of the Bible and they'll just walk through it until they're done and pick another one. At his home on Friday nights, they, they go through their Bible study and then they play Texas Hold'em, which is a card game, poker. 
And men come. Some are, are followers of Christ and some aren't yet. But he's just being salt and light where he is. He's loving men that live around him wherever they are. A couple of weeks ago after Easter, by the way, I just need to say this. Jake is, uh, Jake is not sitting on the chair to be cool. He's sitting on the chair because he's in terrible low back pain and hasn't been able to get any, doesn't have muscle relaxers or, or real pain medicine, and I mean like not anything you can buy over the counter. So trying to get into a doctor, went and saw a chiropractor uh, that didn't help a lot on Saturday, but you know after the first few days you're somehow sore. So uh, if you prefer your worship leader to stand, just know that he will when he can. Uh, but he said he'd already had to miss once due to a low back injury, so if he had to crawl out on stage to lead, he was going to do that. So, two weeks ago at Easter, Julie, I say that, she's uh, Jake's wife, Julie Turner, who's been helping uh, lead volunteer coordination and programming stuff uh, back in uh, Lost Mountain Kids, LM Kids, that are meeting and learning and soaking in the gospel right now. After Easter, they had a number of Easter eggs and balloons and those kinds of things left. So, uh, Jake was at home with a, with a back injury. Julie took the kids, they went and got lunch, and then they came back up here. And they created a number of little bags with all of the leftovers and then topped up and created cute little notes and put on there. And then they gathered them as a family and went back to the apartment complex where they're living right now and delivered them to neighbors. It's just a little note that says, Happy Easter from your friends at Lost Mountain Baptist Church. Had our address and, and website on them. And, and Julie's going there with her kids. One lady was so excited, she, she invited them in, stood, they talked for a while. She was thrilled to have a balloon. Who knew, right? It's the little things sometimes. Julie wasn't being paid to do that. It was just her trying to be salt and light where God has placed her. Trying to be salt and light where God had placed her. This, this is how you and I are primarily called to be salt and light. To bring the hope and the beauty of Jesus Christ and the glory of God into whatever areas we are, sports, art, etc. It's not so much that we're trying to create Christian versions of these to pull people in, but to start discipling people who can bring the presence of Christ and the power of the gospel to where they already are. That's what discipleship really looks like. That's what a body on mission really looks like. And it's amazing what happens in the life of a church where this kind of thing starts catching fire. And God's already placed you in so many places of influence. And the beauty of the church, of a gathering like this, and, and when we gather at other times and in other ways, whether in Sunday school or, or home groups or Wednesday night for certain things, is that the church is a place where all of these different domains and socioeconomic groups collide into a beautiful mosaic of what the gospel is all about. I mean, where else does a, does a CEO or COO or CFO, C-level leader, sit around the table with a shift worker from Burger King and have a meal and talk and laugh and then get up when it's done and go over and minister to children? Nowhere. Nowhere does that happen. Where else does a, a black man whose father whose father was forced to pick up meals from the back door of a restaurant because he was not allowed to enter the restaurant, sit in a small group with a man whose dad was a clan member. And those two men love one another and pray for one another and laugh with one another and poke at one another and encourage and support one another. And they grow deeper in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Huh? Where else does that happen? Our country's trying in all kinds of broken ways to figure this out. But friends, they don't have the answer. The government doesn't have the answer. Political action groups don't have the answer. We have the answer. But when we start looking more like them than like the people God's called us to be, we're not part of the solution. We are part of the problem. And we dishonor God and we bring shame on the name of Christ. When we're as quick to run into tribalism, that's the lost and broken society we're a part of because we can't, we can't discern the difference between our country and the church of Jesus Christ. We're not part of the solution. We're part of the problem. Where else does this kind of stuff happen? Nowhere. This is why Ephesians 3.10 says that it's through the church that God has chosen to make known the manifold wisdom 
of the gospel in heavenly places that even heavenly beings look down at the church where high income and low income people gladly gather around the table and neither takes advantage of the other where black and white come together and laugh and love and encourage and support where highly educated and undereducated minister together using whatever gifts they have Paul says in Ephesians that that the heavenly hosts look down and they marvel at the manifold wisdom of God made known through the gospel of Jesus Christ in his church. The the tough thing is not knowing a passage, is not trying to know or being familiar with a passage like Matthew 5, 13 through 16. It's living it. The problem or the issue that most of us, not all of us, but most of us face in here is not that we don't know enough Bible. We definitely don't know the story, many of us. We know pieces and verses and characters, but in terms of knowing the overall grand narrative of what God's doing in Scripture, I don't think we've spent much time until just recently in the church um, beginning to flesh that out. But knowing enough Scripture is not the problem. It's that it's not getting into the places of us that are dark and sinful and rebellious and disobedient still and changing us. Into men and women who are known by the Great Commission, by the desire to make disciples of all people and baptize them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the triune God, and teach them by life and by word how to live as followers of Christ. It's allowing this knowledge to shape us into men and women who are known by the great commandment that known as men and women who love God with everything that we are and love others the same way that we love ourselves. It's becoming men and women who by God's grace are characterized by the fruit of the Spirit so that when others look at us, if they say, hey, talk to me about them, They're going to talk about your love, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your joy, your faithfulness, your self-control, and on and on. These things that we can't create in and of ourselves, but the gospel creates in us. So what's the best way for light to shine out of the church and into the darkness? The best way for light to shine out of the church and into darkness. The darkness around us is you, you transformed by the gospel. Working in every domain of society. You being transformed by the gospel and being a a businessman or businesswoman. You transformed by the gospel and working in education. You being transformed by the gospel and working in medicine, in agriculture, in the trades, in government, in law enforcement. Across all of the domains of society. That's the best way for the light to shine out of the church. And not only working in every domain, but you transformed by the gospel. Being salt and being light in every area of society. As a stay-at-home mom. As retirees. In your neighborhood. In your school. In your gym. Saying, God, what can I do where I am? You've placed me where I am. You've placed me in the season of life I am. What can I do where I am? Help me to be so that I can do what you've called me to do. And on top of you being transformed by the gospel and living it out in every domain and aspect of society, light shines forth in the darkness by you understanding, grasping at the deepest level that everything you have and everything you are has been given to you by God for God. That everything you have and everything you are has been given to you by God for God to push back the darkness in the world to the glory of God. That's what being salt and light is really about. That's what it means to preserve and to flavor and to illuminate the world around us, rather than taking on the brokenness and fragmentation of the culture around us. This is what Christ is speaking to. 
You are salt and light. But don't lose your saltiness. Don't hide your light. As the worship band makes their way back up here, begins making their way back up here, and we prepare to move into a time where we just respond and we reflect, I want to put a couple of questions before you. Where, where is God calling you to be obedient this morning? Right? Where is God calling you to take what you know, what you've been taught, what you've learned, what you've experienced and taken in through personal times of devotion and through seasons of church life, where is he calling you to to take that and to put it into action? I trust that if you'll ask him that question, he'll speak to you. God, where do I need to be obedient this morning? What do you want me to do? Then I'd also ask you this. As the band prepares to lead us. Where's God calling you to to persevere? Where is it or what is it that you have quit too soon? We, we, we quit too soon, too often. Because everything that, that we get and everything about our society is quick, right? We can get it fast. We can drive through. We can microwave. We can just download it from the clouds somewhere. But spiritual growth is a crawl. It's, to borrow the, the, the phrase of Eugene Peterson, a long obedience in the same direction. And I think too often we go, I tried Sunday school, I didn't get anything out of it. I tried small groups, they, they, they weren't for me. I tried reading my Bible daily, and I was bored the second week. Or I, you know, I made it through Genesis into Exodus, and on, and I didn't know what to do with it. We quit too early. Where is God calling you to be obedient this morning? And where is he calling you to persevere? To get back at something that you may have quit too soon. Quit too early. I hope you'll let those questions sit with you as we sing together, as we reflect. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, this morning... as we place ourselves under the authority of your word, God. As we hear from you the truth that we are salt and we are light, that you have made us so, God, and we hold that intention with the warning that we can lose our saltiness. And when we lose it, we're of no good, no use to a broken world around us. God, that we are light, but our light can be hidden through our actions and our thinking. God, I pray that this morning we would breathe you in deeply. God, we'd ask for forgiveness and repent where that's needed of our own sins. God, we'd receive a fresh wind from you, and a renewing spirit. God, I pray that all of us in here would be asking, what can we do where we are to be salt and light? Acknowledging that all that we have and all that we are comes from you and exists for you. Stir our hearts, God. Show us where to be obedient. Show us where to re-engage. Maybe if we've quit too soon. God, don't leave us the same as we came in here. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.